Thank you very much, Sir Peter. It's really a pleasure for me to be with you today. It was a pleasure to be uh, to attend the dinner yesterday and to meet some of the Sintrofer project. Thank you to Juliana O'Rourke for uh, having contacted me and inviting me and uh, also ensuring me that my participation would be worth, which, which I was not sure about because I am not a specialist in transport. As a result, I finally tended to orient my presentation more on transport than I initially thought I would. And, uh, and I will try to, to, to reflect on several things. The third part is more about facts and figures. Uh, we'll find some of the maps that uh, my colleague here, Fitch, uh, presented. Uh, and the second one is more uh, impressionistic presentation, which is maybe more reflect my personal style. So not about crude facts, but maps that can make uh, reflect some of the things we are think, reflecting in the Commission, especially during the uh, reflection process we carried out two years ago, uh, to which uh, Sir Peter all contributed about cities of tomorrow. So facts and figure first. Uh, speaking with my colleagues, I wanted to know more about what we are the results of EU cohesion policy. And first, I got 2000 and 2006 figures. And initially, I thought, no, this is too old. I shouldn't present it. But finally, I find it very interesting because, as you will see in the next slide, which is about the current period, we, saw, we see that 2000 and 2006, there was a, a big emphasis on rail built or improved, 8,400 kilometers. Uh, 5,100 kilometers of road built or improved, but also a lot of other achievements of uh, cohesion policy, which can be shown here, which is not only a redistribution policy, but an investment policy. It was already true then. It became even stronger in 2007, 2030, which leads to the next figures, which results from the implementation plan reports, uh, uh, new roads, um, uh, 2,236, but also reconstructed roads. So you can see a big increase in the investment on roads, which is not a real surprise because from an urban development point of view, uh, we, have re we have realized that much of the investment, even sometimes when we were asking for integrated urban development, it would result into uh, reinforcing the infrastructure and the road infrastructure, which was very, very weak in many of the less developed regions of Europe. And the minor emphasis compared with figures 2000 and 2006 on new railroads, trans-European networks, railroads, and reconstructed railroads. Instead of 8,000 something, it's now only around uh, 5,000 kilometers. What is obvious? and it was shown by the previous speaker, my colleague here, Fitch, is that uh, important, remedying to important economic and social disparities, uh, closing the gaps remains a key objective. And in terms of uh, funding, it's reflected by the uh, pink, now it's different than the previous presentation, color, <laughs> color map. So, these are the regions with a GDP per capita which is less than 75% of the average uh, EU uh, GDP per capita. And there you can see the regions where there is a concentration of investment. For 2007-2013, this was representing 80% of the ERDF investment. And if you take a country like Poland, I think I, I spoke yesterday with the head of unit for Poland and he said that he could consider that 25, it, repre, it represents 25% of the world budget that we are, we are managing. So I will go very quickly through the other figures where you have in yellow, so the one which are close to the average and in, in pale yellow, the one which are over the average. Another figure which I like, no, sorry. What, what do we propose for 2014, 2020? More concentration, because as was told by the previous speaker, we <clears throat> realized that some of the investments didn't give the results which were expected, and there was too much of uh, spread it thinly on too many things. Uh, and it also applies to urban development, where we try to have focused uh, uh, critical mass, but it was not always uh, easy. 
a stronger focus on results throughout the whole program and also exempted conditionalities. What does it mean, uh, concentrating ERDF investment? Uh, it means that for the more developed regions, 80% of the investment go, must go to four objectives. Initially it was three, but during the negotiation with Parliament it, was, it became four. Energy efficiency and renewable energy, research and innovation, competitiveness of small and medium-sized enterprise, and use of ICT, so using ICT. So, more developed region, 80% should go to these objectives, and 20% of this 80% should go to energy efficiency and renewable energy, and the respective figures for the less development regions are 60% for the four objectives and 15% for um, in, in investment for energy efficiency and uh, renewable. Uh, investment priorities, so the two, it's falls under two thematic objectives. We have 11 now investment priorities, so 11 thematic objectives. Uh, two are addressing transport, thematic objective seven. The two, of, the two first of uh, which are mainly addressed to the connection and investment in the 10T network and connection to the 10T network. And the two, two last on sustainable regional mobility and a comprehensive, high quality and interoperable railway system in this new period, and it will change compared with the figures I presented first, there will be much more emphasis on rail. The other objective, which is more close to urban development, it's about sustainable urban mobility. So under thematic objective, uh, there, there is specific mention of sustainable multimodal urban mobility, and this would apply more for the more developed regions than Objective 7, because we hope that under uh, uh, Objective 4, even the more developed regions may access to funds from the ERDF uh, in an integrated manner. What I have not put in my slide is that we, we have now not only social and uh, economic cohesion in the treaty. We have also territorial cohesion. So territorial has taken a greater emphasis and with a new instrument for this new period called the integrated territorial investment. Under a territor an integrated territorial investment, you may, for example, devise an integrated strategy for a metropolitan area. And within this strategy, you may decide to uh, allocate some of the funds which are in fact uh, labeled under a, nat a transport national OP, but also combine it with funds coming from a regional OP. You could use funds from ESF, European Social Funds, and funds for ERDF, and this for a more integrated strategy. Exante conditionality is important because uh, we, we, we want to really people develop comprehensive transport plan with a realistic and mature pipeline of, for project. We want also to ensure the capacity of intermediary bodies and beneficiary to, de to, to deliver the project pipeline. So now, second part, and I have only five minutes left, um, some maps. I think that you know this map, what is always important and interesting to remind ourselves, and it makes life sometimes more difficult for transport, is that Europe uh, is very dense with a lot of small and medium-sized cities. And I think interesting myself, when I spoke with my colleagues who are no, now working with OECD on an harmonized definition of cities at EU level, and we worked on a definition based on density, urban des density and no more based on uh, uh, administrative border. What we see is that seen from satellite, you can see for, that there is around one third of the population living in uh, areas of more than 50,000 inhabitants. But you have also one third of the Euro full European population, so one third of the 480 million inhabitants, who live either in towns of less than 50,000 inhabitants or in suburbs. And from satellites, you cannot differentiate. So I, I told my colleagues, it's nice to use satellite figure, but we should know more about this because 
of course, it's, it will become very crucial to know what, what is the urban shape, why peri-urban areas are becoming so important, why do we have to preserve small and medium-sized cities as center of services, which maybe are not most competitive at the world level, but regionally, nationally, they have played, played their role for decennies, for, uh, for decades, and they are still important. We cannot just close small cities as we close a company. I mean, we have to, to ensure their sustainability, and we shouldn't close them down, because what will happen is that, and we see it from the migration flows from the east to the west, is that a lot of non-qualified people arrive in our bigger cities and create congestions, unemployment, and more pockets of poverty. So there is an issue there that we have to analyze. Next slide, which I like. The first one is derived from a, a, spun, um, a work by Espon. It's a, a study called Future of Cities, which was done three years ago by a team uh, coordinated by the Université Libre de Bruxelles, Moritz Lennert, who is himself a Berliner, but works in Brussels. And I, I just wanted to compare two maps. One is about the location of universities and print shops in the 15th century. And, uh, the second one, which is taken from uh, the Oxford Handbook of Cities in the, the World History, edited by Peter Clark, is about the corridor of urbanization, where you found not the Pentagon, but the blue banana, <laughs> and another banana which I didn't know, which is less strong, <laughs> which I could call the Mediterranean banana. <laughs> but which also could, could have a powerful, but we, we also have to avoid this tropism, and that was a bit a challenge for regional policy. It used to be a redistribution policy, but with the crisis, with the discourse on growth and competitiveness, there is also a tendency to reinforce the Pentagon and to reinforce the blue banana. So what do we do with this? Should we go for the blue banana, or should we look at the other part of Europe? And of course, we think, at least in the Urban Development and Territorial Cohesion Unit, that we should go also for the other part of Europe. Other map, which I like, still from the Espon Fossi project, it's not about connectivity, it's about contactability. And I like it, it's very confused when you look at it like this, so you must go to the report and read it. But they, they, they did a crazy work. They, they took the timetable for flights, air flights, for trains, and they say, okay, I don't want to spend more four hours in public transport, and I want to have a meeting for four hours. Where can I go from each of the city? And, they, and then they define contactability, where you see again that there is a kind of cluster of cities which have a good level of contactability, and others which in fact, cannot reach as many cities during one day if they want to meet with other people. I can take the example of Br Brno. Uh, uh, in Br in Br sorry for the pronunciation. The lady from Brno, with whom we worked in the cities of tomorrow, told me, we have a very high investment in R&D, but we are concerned because our connectivity is very low. Another friend from Hungary told me, it's fine to have air connectivity, but it can take me eight hours to go in a city which is 200 kilometers from, from me on the other side of the border. So I think this contactability index is interesting because we don't, we don't have to look only at the supply but also to the offer, uh, no, sorry, to, to only to the supply and the offer of transport but to the demand of transport, where people need to go. This is the, I think I have, no, I think I have 30 seconds left. <laughs> so this is the traditional city, and what we also said in our report, and I think we don't measure the impact of this, is that the city, de facto, is no more the city de jure. What we call city is no more what we used to call a city, and now that way, uh, as Peter all indicated, we, we should think about p city regions. This is about the surrounding about Milano, Monza, and company, what was told by the vice rector of Politecnico de Milano is that, in fact, the links between the peripheral cities may become more and more important. And it's true that in this respect, transport is a crucial element if we want to strengthen cooperation between cities. But we also saw other things in this region. High-speed train was built between Torino 
and Milano, and between Milano and Bologna, and the result is, is exactly opposite that what was expected. The expectation was to reinforce uh, accessibility for Torino and Bologna, but the result is that more people from Torino and from Bologna goes to Milano to work in Milano. So we have to analyze these kind of things. So last thing, but I will not go through it, monocentric, polycentric structures. Uh, I could have expanded on the example of urban planning in Barcelona. Last, not, I think it's the last one. Last <coughs> slide, the one on density. Yeah, on the top left, you have Atlanta. I checked yesterday night. In Atlanta, the agglomeration is 5.5 million inhabitants. Uh, it's the same in Barcelona, which is more on the uh, down the left side. The difference is that you have the same number of inhabitants on a territory which is five times or ten times bigger. So how can you uh, have a cost-benefit transport in such situations? So we will have also to go further into the impact of urban sprawl, density, compact cities, and the shape of uh, territories. Thank you for attention.